basically we developed these capillary pressure versus saturation diagrams um, which show how a non-aqueous phase liquid goes somewhere in the first little while uh, says nothing about how quickly it gets there but it does say something about the equilibrium distribution of saturations and we used these geometries for the Vado zone and also for Dean Apple to be able to say something about where they would go. Um, and uh, the next subject was to look at how quickly they go there. And so basically what we did was we recast uh, Darcy's law, which you would have seen in 452 for one phase, uh, into the case where you split it for red and green fluids, for two different fluids. Uh, the locations of those fluids, if you centrifuge them down into one uh, into two separate regions would be like this thing on the right. And then you can just write Darcy's Law individually for each of those components, basically the idea, and calculate exactly what the flow is for each of them. Uh, and to take account of the fact that, uh, I don't know if this is very useful to, to zoom through it like this, but to take care of the fact that if you write Darcy's Law uh, in this way, or I guess I can't write uh, on this, then there are two, two parts. One is this the swimming pool part, which if you look at the change in pressure with depth, it's just the, you know, just going down in a swimming pool. It's the pressure that you feel as you, your ears would uh, go deeper and deeper. And on top of that, there's another pressure gradient, which is really the one that drives flow. And the basic idea is if you go in a swimming pool, a static fluid. It's not going anywhere because it's in equilibrium, but you still feel a pressure difference as you go down. It. And it's this pressure difference here, and this pressure difference cannot drive flow. And so you're basically uh, removing that portion from the true one. And so if the real pressure gradient is this one that you see here, then it comprises a part which is kind of an immobile part, which doesn't drive flow, and a difference between those and it's the difference between those which drives the flow. And so that's probably more information than you need. But, um, yes, go ahead. Uh, we had like uh, really X diagrams uh, for uh, rel perms. Yeah, the relative mm -hmm. permeability curves. Um, there was one where the non wetting is like larger than the wetting, and then there's the other one where they're both equal and just straight lines. Are those like, is one a simplified, is the straight line X curve? Uh, simplified version, or is it like, are they related in any way? I was yes. That one yes, X curve is just a simplified way of looking at it. Um, do I actually have a, I can actually add a thing here, right? Yeah, so let's do this. The bottom line is, yes, the X curve is a simplified one. Ah, just, it's nice to have a class where you can have a conversation. You probably don't realize that. I think you, you're supposed to be meek and uh, not say anything. It's much more interesting when there's some conversation going on. We can do all kinds of interesting things. So I think the question is that if you look at um, the relative permeability, so that's, uh, we know that if you look at capillary pressure versus saturation curves, They look like this. The, the axes are saturations of water. What's um, this curve called? Yeah. What and why? Someone else. So I could just shout. <laughs> It's how the, the soil reacts to water. Yeah, that's right. So, exactly. Air coming in or an apple coming in and therefore the other. And so the question was that uh, and we've that the bounds on this, they both have the same axes, right? This is saturation of water saturation between zero and one. Um, what are these bounds that I'm putting on here. So first of all, what's so if one's called the saturation, the drying curve, what's the other one called? Okay. 
You actually looked at the stuff? Good God, what the hell's wrong here? So it's um, one of these um, no-go areas. So this is the irreducible saturation of water, right? SW0. And this is the irreducible saturation of the non-wetting. I guess you've just done an assignment related to that, um, that you just got back. So that's what these are. And so the question was, there are some curves for relative permeabilities that go on this. They vary between 0 and 1 also. And they look like, oh, I, like, I found out how to use different colors, so I need different colors. And they look like, like this, and I think this. And then they do something to get across here. So that's one way they can look. And I haven't left myself much space, but the question was, that these curves could also look like a simplified form. And I suppose I could have answered it with a simple answer. The answer is that the simplified form is a simplified form and an idealized form. And they look like this, the x curves. Just because we don't know those very well. So this is relative permeability it's between 1 and 0. And this is just the same saturation of water on the bottom between 0 and 1. And so I think the these are the real curves. Uh, they're the real curves because they typically uh, don't necessarily add to 1. Uh, these, in all cases, do add to 1, right? So which one is the relative permeability curve for water? Which one? Yeah. And this would be for the non-wetting. Because at 100% saturation of water, which is this, it's a just flowing water, and you, so you'd expect this to be one. You'd expect the non aqueous the other phase. Uh, you'd expect this one to be zero because there is no, basically none, none. If you, if you believe that you can get across here, and so those would be the relative permeability magnitudes. And so the other way I suppose you could think about, I mean the other the, the useful way to think about this is that if you're trying to get the volumetric flow of, say, water, it would be equal to the permeability divided by the viscosity of water. <laughs> we just slammed the door on you. Thanks. Oh, come on. Yeah, please, yeah. Does it not close? I, I just... Yeah, that's right. You're not being forceful enough. <laughs> so, uh, this would be the... Uh, so, you could write... You could imagine, for, for the drawing that we have, that if this is a tube of stuff, and we can centrifuge it, so that part of it is filled with one fluid, and the other part is filled, I guess we used red and green before, but it's fine, is that if you look at these relative proportions, the, the proportion of this, which is this area here, is proportional to the saturation of green, right? So if it was 100% green saturated, saturation would be 1. And so what we're, you can think of this as is if you take the permeability and viscosity, you multiply by the area of the end of this, and you multiply that by the saturation of water, and drive, oops, 
drive it by the pressure gradient. Then this is just writing Darcy's law, where you're ignoring the blue part, but you're just calculating the area based on what proportion of the total area and the relative saturation, which you can think of it. And so if the saturation on one of the previous photographs, you now we had this diagram that looked like, I think it looked like this. You know, the middle part was red, and the external part was green, just to use the same colors we used before. Then the relative saturations of these are basically the area fractions that take up this whole system, which is the same as this. And so if you think about it, this term here is some scaling parameter that takes the permeability of the medium. So permeability is a, a material property where the, the permeability of a sand is the permeability. It doesn't matter if it's flowing water or gas or methane or, or treacle, as long as it's Newtonian. It's permeability, so it's one value. The viscosity of the fluid that's flowing is that viscosity. But you can think of this area, this is basically the relative permeability. And this is the multiplier that you're multiplying this by to be able to scale it. And so if you think about this, um, sometimes these relative permeability curves, just to go back to, again, coming back to your question, you could imagine that one way to draw these relative permeability curves would be like this. Same axes as before. This I'm just going to draw it as a true X curve, not with these little flat parts on it that you have here, these little feet, but the true flat parts that are missing between 0 and 1. And if you think about it, so this now gives us this let's see if magenta. So here this gives us you choose any point on here. So this is the particular saturation that you find yourself at, at which you find yourself. So this relative permeability would be equal to this amount. This is Kr between 0 and 1. Uh, and this amount would be a different one. So this would be Kr for water. This would be Kr for water. And all it's doing is it's saying that the area of this that is controlled by the green fluid is basically scales with relative permeability. That's what it is. So you can think of relative permeabilities. Sometimes you could use saturation directly as the magnitude you use to get it. So I think that's what it is. But to answer your question, yeah, this is a simplification because we typically don't aren't don't take measurements of this but this probably gives us a reasonable enough approximation. And you'll get a chance, I think assignment four gets you to use a curve like this to do some calculations. So you'll get to use it. Okay, long answer for short question. Perhaps worthwhile doing. <coughs> All right, so think of things this way. So this is Darcy's Law. I think last time or in the, the videos, we went through how to write this in terms of heads, if you feel more comfortable with that and what they mean. Uh, the difference between heads and pressures are included in this kind of swimming pool effect, which kind of complicates matters. Um, if you're looking at horizontal flows, of course, that doesn't come into it because you're just going in a horizontal direction. It's only when you have vertical flows you have to take a, account for that. And so sometimes rewriting this in terms of heads is a useful, useful way to do it. Okay, what else? Yeah, so so that was the essence. So, so, so the essence of what we've done so far, I think, is this. Is that these are the behaviors that control flow in the subsurface. This controls the equilibrium uh, saturations of the different fluids. This controls the rates at which they pass through the, the porous medium as a single uh, individual phase. And that if you know those parameters, you can do some pre pretty simple calculations to be able to figure out what those, those rates are, I believe. So. so, where are we? There we go. So, uh, what other things? For the good of the order, um, 
I think KJ's put you in groups. We'll broadcast those groups. We talked about these six different remediation methods, so we'll assign one of those to. Is that up online now, or will you send them something? Yeah. So. Yeah. It seems to me thirteen three hundred three was always problematic for people to find out exactly what groups they're in, teams they're in, uh, because it's not so obvious on Angel, I think. And so maybe we can send the the names and assign one remediation topic to each and be great. Um, and I guess uh, today there'll be another assignment comes live. Instead of getting it on Thursday, perhaps we'll do it for Sunday, Sunday midnight. So, and then we can get back on track. Okay. All right. So back in this. All right. So um, I guess that was the the, the recap. Um, so. What we're interested in, so, so now we know enough about the behavior of these fluids in the subsurface to be able to say, to be able to, to look at what we think the, the broader implications of their behavior might be. And so that's, I think, what we plan to, to do today. No, I think it's what we do plan to do. And so, as we know, these non-aqueous fluids come in two flavors. They come in terms of those that are lighter than water and those that are denser than water. And so we're interested in each case because we realize that in each case we get quite different behaviors. And we've seen those from looking at uh, these types of responses. And that is where it's lighter than water, we expect that it will float on the free surface uh, and then dissolve in the groundwater below it and then be carried away by the advection of that groundwater. And in cases where it's denser than the water itself, it'll uh, pass through it. Um, we know from what we've talked about that depending on the, the critical height that it reaches, once it gets moving, it will keep on going unless it uh, necks down and splits into parts which are less than this critical height, in which case it will stop. And otherwise, it won't stop until it hits some kind of capillary barrier. And the capillary barrier is defined uh, not in terms of permeability, uh, it's not, it doesn't stop it because it has low permeability, but it stops it because the pores are too small for it actually to get into underneath the limited head that it has to push into it, because that head is only driven by gravity, the height of the column. And um, although those sediments typically are low permeability, the mechanism by which it gets in that is not by, by permeability alone. It's just that permeability scales with the magnitude of um, entry pressures. And I guess we know that because, uh, we, and I think there's some little derivation last time, that if you look at these entry pressure figures, again, this capillary pressure versus saturation of water from 0 to 1, that looks something like this. that if you write it, instead of being in terms of capillary pressure, but you write it in terms of this Leverett function, then it defines it as capillary pressure normalized by an interfacial tension and multiplied by the permeability of the porous medium divided by the porosity square root. And uh, just in looking back through the, the video that you'd have looked at, um, we also generated a result that allowed us to take a bundle of capillaries and use that bundle of capillaries to be able to define the permeability. And I think the permeability came out to be something like um, porosity multiplied by the diameter of these capillaries squared. divided by either 32 or 96, depending on how we do it. Yeah. In other words, if you take, well, it doesn't matter, either nine, 32 or 96, one is three times the other. It depends on whether you have capillaries going only in one direction through the system, which use up all the porosity, or whether you have this network of them orthogonal to each other in three dimensions, mm -hmm. in which case you get a third of the permeability divided by 96 instead of 32. But if we can write permeability in terms of this, and we can also write capillary pressure, entry pressure at this point here, 
PC0 is equal to, can anyone remember? I think it was 4 times interfacial tension divided by diameter. So in other words, if we can, and this is just actually the equation from a flow in a pipe. So the flow rate in a pipe is proportional to diameter to the power of 4 and the pressure gradient and some other terms. Um, so if you can derive a, uh, a relationship that defines permeability in terms of this diameter, the same diameter here, then if you equate these to each other, you can do it right now if you wanted to, then you can relate permeability to capillary pressure. And if you do that, then basically that's what this expression is. And I think uh, we ended up calculating that this value for J from this expression should be equal to, do you remember? Yeah, it is in the Leverett terms. In our calculation, I think it came out as 4 over 10, 0 0.4, which is almost 0.3. I just threw in some ballpark numbers and didn't do the math properly, but so it's close to that. But you're right, it's 0 0.3 in uh, uh, Leverett terms. And so that's where it comes from. So there's a relationship between these. So I guess all, I was just trying to make the point that although this means that the permeability of this bed is low, that is not the mechanism that's stopping it going through. This is the mechanism that's stopping it going through. And it just happens that the pore diameter is related to permeability in some way. And so when you see a permeability, so for a very tight rock, say a clay, or I think the Yucca Mountain Tufts, the permeabilities are of the order of 10 to the minus 18 meters squared. This is proportional to the pore diameter squared from, from this. So porosity, well, porosity is less than one. It's, it's, you know, it may be a factor of two off, or two orders of magnitude off, right? So porosity may be 10%, and this is uh, almost, uh, this is 10. So together, those are a factor of 100 different. But to, to the first order, you can use this. And so that would suggest that the diameters of the pore sizes at Yucca Mountain are of the order of um, 10 to the minus 9 meters squared. Nan nanometers, in other words. And so well, it's probably a bit smaller than they are in, in reality because there's this factor of 100, but it's of, of a rough ballpark magnitude. That's physically what it's saying. And so you can think of this number for, of permeability and its dimensions always seem very strange as meters squared, but it's really some um, proportionality to the pore diameters which are uh, controlling the flow. All right. So I digress. So let's go back, get back to where we are. So our interest in, is in being able to say something about the, the behaviors of these in the subsurface. And we'll deal with uh, L apples first. We won't do anything with that. We won't do anything with that. Um, but we'll say some things about uh, behaviors and maybe some things that also, like groundhog fill, seem uh, bass backwards and not quite so logical. And that is that uh, it's you'd expect that the mag the, the the retention capacity of soils, if you have them very open graded, such as gravels, then you'd be able to contain more fluid in those than if you have very small, um, uh, small, small grain sizes. It turns out that, of course, the, the reverse is, is true, right? Because if you have open grain sizes, the fluid doesn't get held in there by capillarity, it drains out, and therefore it's basically dry. If you have things that have very um, small pores, then those pores will tend to get saturated just by the hydrophilic nature of the water being sucked in there onto the grain surfaces. And so the water retention capacity on those is, is much higher. And so if you look at the capillary rise in those in very fine grain materials such as silts, the capillary rise will be high. And actually if you look at the uh, volume of fluid per unit volume that is held in there by capillary forces, will also be much larger because it will completely fill up the pore size. So typically, you know, fine grain materials might have porosity, say, of 
and actually coarse grain materials might have very similar porosities. And so the porosities don't differ very much, but the ability to actually contain water in them by being held, by filling the pore space, is much larger in a fine grain material where you fill most of the pore space with water by capillarity, as opposed to a very coarse grain material where you'll fill only the, the surface of the grains and maybe a small amount around the, the grain contacts. And so that always seems a little uh, strange, but it's, that's a natural consequence basically of, of this, that you fill the pore space up as a function of capillarity because the diameters of the pore throats are much smaller and therefore it can suck fluid into them. All right, so if we look at real materials, uh, we've said something about this already. The didn't do that. The geometry of this is that if this is the water table, um, we have by definition a capillary fringe, and by definition this is sometimes referred to as the tension saturated zone, because in this zone it is as fully saturated as it can be with water with no moisture, uh, with no air within this. And it's only once we get above this zone here that the um, component of air that exists in here, so this is the saturation of the air, and this would be saturation of water, begins to change. Um, these correspond to uh, what we talked about before in terms of pendular saturations and uh, funicular saturations. And so if you recall what those were before, so the pendular zone is where we have Oops. I'm not going to be able to draw this very well. If we have a porous medium with all these grains contacting each other, then the pendular zone was where most of the void space, so if you look at the contact between two grains, I uh, will use as a portion of this which is which is filled so the uh, the green stuff here is the air which is around it this is in the Vedo zone so up here most of it would be air which is this green and very little of it would be water but the water that does exist, exists at the grain-to-grain -grain contacts, almost like a donut that goes around it, like a pendant that's around it. And the, the air, as you go from one pore to the other, is continuous. So there's a continuous phase of air. So if you put a straw in here and suck, all you'll suck out is air. No water will come out because it's just held in so tightly onto these, these, these grain surfaces. In the funicular zone, I'm not sure whether I can that or not. Not very good grains, are they? So, terrible grains. <laughs> I'll be careful what I draw, I suppose. Um, in this zone, which is down here, then all of a sudden the air, sorry, the water is increasing, so maybe this is the way to, uh, yeah. So now this is the water that's increased to fill all this space. And the only part that's left is this little green island that sits in the middle here. This is our so-called funicular saturation, 
because now if we put um, a straw into here and suck, all that we'll pull out is water. The water phase is continuous as you go from one pore to its uh, neighbor. And within these pores, there's a small amount of uh, air that exists as a bubble in the middle. And so now if we suck, we suck out water only down here because it's continuous. And the gas phase, the green air phase, is no longer continuous. And so it physically changes as we go from one to the other. We talked about it before in terms of oil reservoirs. Um, the water was water, and the oil was what is our air here, uh, our non-wetting fluid. But the behavior is exactly the same. So in terms of this definition of these two zones, that's what's going on. So um, by definition, uh, the pressure here at the water table is atmospheric. Uh, as we go up from this, by definition, you know, like pulling a column of water up by the bootstraps, then the pressure has to diminish and was sub-atmospheric as we go up here. And as we keep on going up here, the water pressure uh, will continue to be lower and lower pressure, more, more and more tension, if you like. So, so progressively less and less uh, as we go up here. The air pressure, on the other hand, will be continuous as we go here. And because the density of air is a thousandth the density of water, then it's basically the same pressure as you go up through here. That's, that's perhaps we don't need to know that right now. And so our interest in doing this is, so now uh, our interest is in um, dumping something into this. So now what we'd like to do is pour something into this system. And we know what we expect to happen is this, right? You dump something in here. Ooh, it's bright colors. You make this chimney, which is a smear, and it accumulates at the bottom. The bottom is controlled by being buoyed by the water that it sits on. And we've always drawn this as being, this being the top of the capri fringe, in other words, here and pushing down that capillary fringe by virtue of the fact that we have a certain height of material above here which makes a bigger pressure here on this than it would be if we didn't have anything sitting on it, which is the me mechanism. So what we'd like to know is exactly how this would evolve and, and rationalize what that is in terms of this distribution. Because now, different from the two cases you looked at, we have three fluids in the system, right? We have water that exists here, and we have water and air that exists here, and we're adding a third fluid in to the top. So how do we deal with that? So we'll deal with it pictorially in terms of what we'd expect to happen. So this is the same picture as before. Again, um, was it elevation? Yeah, it was. It's elevation above water table. Um, in, instead of being saturation, so this is saturation of water between 0 and 100%. Uh, you remember that we talked about a different measure of volumetric moisture content, and that is this. So this is moisture content. Moisture content. And so by definition, this is the volume of water divided by the total volume, often given the term theta. And this is vol moisture content. So that's what this is. If you remember, the saturation was given by the volume of water divided by the volume of voids, which by definition was saturation water. And so I suppose Vt is equal to what? Vt is equal to the volume of solid plus the volume of voids. So just a different uh, terminology. So when the volume of water is equal to complete a saturation of 100%, then the volume of water will be equal to the volume of voids. And by definition, the volume of voids divided by the total volume is porosity. 
which I think we'll call N. I think it's been called N in your assignments. So, in other words, if you fill all the pore space up with water, then it's 100% saturated. And so, in other words, when it's 100% saturated, the volumetric moisture content, which is this, would equal to the volume of voids. And if the volume of voids divided by the volume of total, so in other words, 100% saturation would equal the porosity. And so that's why this value here is equal to the porosity, essentially. Now, neglect the fact that there's a residual air in there. But this, when it's 100% saturated, then it's equal to the porosity. So useful uh, landmark to know. And so this arises from two things, right? This, this is the term that agronomists and soil scientists use, hydrogeologists use. This is what petroleum engineers, just terminology, terminological differences, but the, the mechanics are exactly the same. All right. So what happens? So we add stuff in here. This is what it looks like at time zero. So we have three snapshots here after time zero. 120 minutes, so two hours, um, eight hours, and some final condition. So what's happened is that you drop the stuff in the top. This is the oil that comes in. And so if you look at any particular level across here, then you could say something about the individual components of this. Actually, it's written on here. So, so this is the true porosity here, 0.38%. We, we draw this. Ignore this. So this is because there's residual air in the system. So this is the 100% saturated. So if you wanted to, actually, you could do this as saturation of water from zero, which is here, to 100%, which is here. And so this is this value. This is porosity. And so if you go across here, then by definition, what's this portion is the portion that is air. So I guess it's the air content. This portion here is oil. Theta O. Can you see that stuff, by the way? And this portion here is water. So the three components making this up. And so as time goes on, if you look at these, then this is the first one. This is time zero. There's nothing in the system. This is the second one, as you have this tongue going in with this little excursion here, pushing down as it moves down through the system. At a later time, then what, is, what has it done? It's taken the uh, water table. If you compare it here, the water table was originally above that, and it's flattened it down. So it's pushed the water table down, the top of the capri zone, I guess, rather than the water table. And now this is uh, the oil content. And then over time, it's come to some um, equilibrium condition, which is equivalent to this. And so if you think about this equilibrium condition in terms of what the saturation profile would look like as you went down through this, then it's exactly this last plot that we have here. And so if you think about drawing something to the side of this, then um, let me do it. Let me do it with this. What's it going to be? Um, it's going to be a lens that has 
gathered on the bottom here. It's created um, a chimney that goes down that is smeared as it goes down through here. And the water table sits at the bottom, which has been depressed by this stuff sitting on top of it. And so this is physically what it would look like if we drew basically the Capley pressure versus saturation curve in that um, if you go across here, this amount here is equal to the saturation, but it's not the volumetric moisture content of the oil. And this is equal to the volumetric moisture content of the water. And the white, I suppose, which we don't have a component for, is the residual air that's here. And so you can think about those individual components. So this is physically what it looks like, and it looks similar to a capillary pressure versus saturation curve. You can think of this, well, this is actually an elevation as you go up here, but you could also think of this as being equal to a capillary pressure magnitude as you go up through this just the difference between the pressures of these different fluids as you go up through here. And so this is a manifesta manifestation of this geometry as you go through here. It's exactly what it would look like. The other way that you could think about it, I suppose, and this following this is just a, a description, uh, is this is the same sequence if you imagine looking at the magnitudes of the fluid pressures as you go through the same sequence. So sequence one is just the the water in place before anything happens. And so this is this. As you go down through the column, then where the water pressure is equal to atmospheric, by definition, that's the water table. Um, the tension saturated zone is where the Water within the pore space is in tension, but the pores are small enough that uh, they can keep the air from coming in because they're very small diameter pores until they get a high enough tension on the system, which is this tension here. Oh, this keeps on doing this. And in which case, uh, it would start letting air into the system. And so uh, I can't draw it very well. But I, if I overprint this, ignore this diagram, well, don't ignore the thing I'm drawing, but ignore the other diagram to the left of this. So if I drew this here, a capillary pressure versus saturation curve, then It would look something like this. And so this would be the the drying curve. And so it represents this point is where a bubble of air is able to get into it because now the capillary pressure, the difference between the air pressure, which is zero, so this here would be the magnitude of the capillary pressure, which we're scaling on this diagram here. The capillary pressure is high enough to get to saturate the biggest pore that's in the system, which is still very small, but it saturates that biggest pore. And so physically, that's what that means. As you go further above this, then the water is further and further in tension. So this is just the, you know, that the gradient of this is equal to change in pressure with elevation is equal to negative unit weight of water, rho g, which is 1. And so since this is uh, elevation and this is uh, pressure, then this is 1 and this is rho g. The slope of this has to be that, right? You know that. But that's, so that's kind of a, maybe a diversion. So 
which one is which. So A, B, this is in a different sequence. So this is the, the sequence. So now you pour oil into the top. Originally the water table is here. This oil is a tongue that's coming down from the top. It compresses the capillary fringe and it makes the pressure in the oil that's been coming into the system equal to atmospheric. And again, this, uh, this gradient of this line always remains parallel to this. It's going to be the unit, by definition, it has to be uh, follow the unit weight of water, and so it has to have this slope. As you continue to allow this to compact, then what it does is this nose no longer just touches the atmospheric condition. It goes across it by inference and keeps on going across it. And so what, by definition, you have here is you have a water table. So this is the top of the water that has a certain pressure to it. This is the column of fluid, which is oil. It sits on top of it. And what this has done is it's compressed the, uh, the water table below it and actually made it rise uh, a small amount. So in other words, originally the water table was at 50 centimeters. Now it's at something like 80 centimeters right here, above here. And so this is this component that comprises two parts. There's an oil table here, by definition, because the pressure of the oil equals atmospheric. And the pressure of the water here, by definition, is also equal to atmospheric. So I guess by way of saying, a long way of saying, that we have both a water table and we have an oil table. And I guess you could have figured that by thinking about the geometries of these uh, lenses that we have. Right? You have this thing that's sitting here. Which is this lens that's happy to sit here. Previously you had a water table which still exists and the water table has done something underneath here which is it's raised itself a little bit but it's still essentially in the same position. But on top of this you also have this oil table which is the top of this lens and that's given by this point. So the relevance I guess is that anything on this dotted vertical curve means that the pressure is atmospheric, this is the top of the water, this is the top of the wall, oil, and therefore you have a, an oil table that over, over sits the, um, the water table. So what we'd like to be able to do is we'd like to be able to figure out exactly what this height might be uh, because that would say how much product we have in the, the subsurface. And we'd also like to be able to, if we do a site investigation, to be able to drill a hole through this. So if we drill a hole through the middle of this and take some measurements of what the water level's in, we'd like to be able to make some estimates of exactly what the thickness of the free product is that's in the system. And so directly we're going to use this observation um, that is congruent between both of these. This is the same thing, right? This is the oil table here that sits on top of this. And this is the water table underneath it. We can't really tell from this because this is defined in terms of um, saturations versus height. But we can tell from this because this, by definition, gives us the magnitudes in terms of pressures, which is the definition of an oil table. Okay. So what we'd like to do is be able to figure out exactly how thick this product is. So that's, this is what we're leading up to. And it's relatively straightforward. So if you, you accept the, f the fact that if you have a lens here, then we have an oil table and a water table. If you drill a hole through this, um, if we measure the level of oil within the borehole, we might think that that would be equal to the thickness of this lens. That would be a reasonable assumption. It turns out not quite to be the case, but we can adjust for it. And so this is the, the rationale of this. So imagine that you drill a hole through this lens, just like this. 
And what you'd expect to happen is that the water would flow from this into the borehole, and the overlying supernatant fluid would also be present in the borehole. What we could imagine is that within this borehole, there would be an interface between the oil, which is green, and the water, which is blue. And between those, the pressures are given by the different uh, components. So the pressure in the oil is going to be the height of the oil above it multiplied by its unit weight. So the pressure in the oil should be the thickness of the oil times gravity. Well, gravity and density are unit weight, right? So this is gamma oil. And so that's just the swimming pool effect. We'd expect that kind of to be the same as the pressure acting up, but it's not. And the reason for that is that we've made the point that if there's uh, water in the system and the water table exists, then by definition on this boundary, the pressure has to be atmospheric. And if the pressure is atmospheric on this boundary, as we go down some amount, which is this, and I guess we're calling this amount W, this is W, then as you go down from this height here to here, then the pressure in the water has to be equal to W times that. So if these are equal to each other, sitting in the well bore where there's no capillarity acting, then it turns out that we can relate the thickness of the, pro the, the, thickness of the product in the borehole, which is not the same as the thickness here. This thickness here is going to be what? T minus W, right? So the true thickness is going to be T minus W. And so if we can measure W in the bore, sorry, if we measure T in the borehole and we can calculate what W is, then we have a chance of being able to uh, figure out exactly what the true thickness is. So we can calculate what W is if we know what T is, and we know that the true thickness is going to be T minus W. And so, if that's the case, then we can figure out exactly what this is. So if you know the thickness of it, then we can do something to calculate how much free product we have. And I suppose for that we need to... Actually, the figure is right there, so I won't redraw it. So, as we go down with depth here, you could imagine that we could draw a capillary pressure diagram that represents this behavior here, just as we had done here. Right? This is a capillary pressure diagram versus height above it. And so if we do that down at the bottom here, then this here is the height T minus W. Just to get them both on the same page. I don't want to make it too small, but it's useful if it's on the same page. So this is this height here, which is just here. We know that as we go up from this, the capillary pressure versus saturation curve for the oil that sits above here, which I can now maybe expand, is going to be equal to a certain amount of material, which is going to be air. Sorry, this is irreducible saturation of water, right? So we know that there's going to be a certain amount of water that's held in there that can't escape, and that the oil can only fill up the remainder apart from that. And so this amount here is going to be 1 minus the irreducible saturation of water. And so if we want to get a reasonable estimation of the amount of 
an apple that's present, in this case lighter than water, an apple that's present, then it's this block here. And in reality, there'd be a portion here that we would have that would um, be discounted, and a portion here also. But if we just ignore those and, and draw this block, which is probably good enough for estimation purposes, then the amount of free product we have is going to be the height. The area of which it is, so it's over some certain area, this lens is over some area, it has a certain height, and so together the two of those give a volume. This is a volume of the reservoir. The pore space that, occupy, that the fluid can occupy is only the porosity times this volume. So if we pre-multiply by porosity, then this whole term here represents the amount of pore space that's available. And the pore space can't be 100% filled with uh, an apple because there's a certain amount of water that's present within the system. And so all we're trying to do is, is correct this for the amount of using the pressure saturation versus capillary pressure diagrams to figure out how much of the pore space can be filled. Can't be filled by a certain amount of water which is already there, but the remainder of it could be. Uh, and if you wanted to, I suppose, you could modify this by the fact that if you also have air within the system, then you also have that portion which isn't accessible either. And so if you look at this, um, people are still drawing stuff, so I won't move it yet, is that ultimately if you wanted to calculate the approximate recoverable volume in the system, then it would be this, this amount here. So this is the volume of the aquifer. Up to this point. This would be the volume of the pore space. And the total including the other components. This is the volume of the free product. So, product. So, the volume of the aquifer multiplied by prosty gives the volume of the pore space within that aquifer. That pore space is only accessible by 100% minus how much water is there and minus how much air is there. So this actually is the, the saturation of air. It's residual air that's left in the system. This is water. Okay, so bottom line is it's just a, a block chart that you can think of. And so it all stems from the observation, I think, that if you measure the thickness of the free product that, that decants, if you like, into the borehole, where there's no capillarity acting, it'll be taller than it exists in the porous medium because of the effect of capillarity. If we can calculate what this value W is, if we can measure T, if we know that the true thickness is T minus W, and we can calculate W and measure T, then we have T minus W. If we have T minus W, we can use that together with how broadly distributed this is in area. If you know what the porosity is, so what's the porosity? Porosity is uh, 10 to 30 percent as a ballpark number. And these irreducible saturations are of the order of maybe 10% each. So you can get some reasonable approximation of exactly what's going on. Uh, but it allows you to be able to calculate what the 
the saturation would be. There's a um, okay. There's a calculation in um, Fetter's book. I don't know how many people have Fetter's book. By the way? how many people bought it? Uh, so yeah, maybe not some. Some doesn't matter. Um, there's this derivation in Fetter's book, which is exactly the same. Gives you a very very long, complicated formula, basically the same uh, idea as this, where it uses the Capri pressure versus saturation curves to figure out this very exactly. And rather than coming up with a relatively straightforward expression like this, comes up with something very complicated for data that you probably don't have. Um, but so I'm not necessarily suggesting you go through this, but it's the same idea. That you can work out the saturation of the fluids as you go down in the soil profile for things like the capillary pressure versus saturation curves. If you define those capillary pressure saturation curves, in the way that they were defined in brooks corey uh, relationships. We talked about effective saturations and normalized pressures and these log relationships. If you do that, then you come up with the same, same kind of idea as before, but it's a bit more of a complicated expression. I'm not sure you necessarily need that, but I think it's useful to understand exactly um, where that comes from. Much easier to use this, this expression here. That you have on the bottom of this page. Certainly give you something pretty close to, to the other expression. But it basically comes from the same idea. If you can calculate what the relative pressure versus saturation curves are, and you can sub, uh, subtract the uh, NAPL one from the air one, you end up with the true NAPL behavior. That's, that's all. All right, so what else? Other behaviors. You can imagine, I, I, I'm sure you can imagine that if you have this lens sitting on top of uh, the water table like this, which is what we talked about, where you have these various uh, saturations. And so in this particular case, you can't make this out, but this is, uh, this is the oil to the right of this line here. This is air and this is water. If the water table drops down by some large amount, just by summertime, then this supernatant project product will just drop down with it and it will smear its chimney along the length of it. And so again, this is the oil saturation. This is the chimney, this amount here. This is the saturation of oil. This is the lens that's sitting at the bottom as it goes down here. Then when the water table rises again, then it will certainly take this material with it as it rises to the top and ends up being a lens that now sits here. And what it will do is it will smear all the length here. And so it's actually quite an effective way, as you can imagine, to be able to get the stuff that was originally sitting in the chimney here to smear it down here in the Vado zone where it can't really go very far very quickly but when the water comes back up again then what it's done is it's left this smear which is now present here and so now as water flows through the saturated zone um, I guess it'd be in the opposite direction right this is the water table here it's going down from right to left and so the flow would be from right to left, and it would take it with it, and then it transports it downstream as a as a plume. So, so it's interesting. It's useful to understand thing, uh, the behavior. And so the only point we've made, I think, is that if you look at dropping this stuff into the subsurface, um, you end up with a water table and an oil table. If you allow yourself to rationalize that then you could imagine that with an oil table and a water table, you end up with a different thickness of product in a borehole, which is larger than that in, uh, in situ. Then you can correct for that magnitude. And the rest is just the implications of what happens as a result of uh, fluids going up and down. OK. Well. Uh, yeah, let's go straight to this figure. So we made the case for a lighter 
than water napple. And we made the case that the stuff that sits in a borehole will actually be deeper than it sits in the aquifer that it, it's derived from. So what would it look like if we have something that's denser than water? And so we know that if you drop something into the subsurface which is denser than water, then uh, it'll keep on going. And so if we had a capillary barrier here, and if we had the ground surface here, then what we expect is we have this chimney a lens that sits on the bottom at um, at the bottom of this just to this would be this smeared zone that goes down through here so relatively low saturation and then this would be not a hundred percent napple saturation but maybe eighty percent because it has water in the rest of it or maybe ninety percent saturated with napple and so what would it look like in a borehole if we went down through this, if we drew a borehole through this. So if you look at the saturation versus depth diagram, then as you go down to this lens, the amount which is napple filled will be this, full amount. The remaining amount which is here has to be water filled. This is the irreducible saturation of water, so this water is always left in there. Uh, this is the irreducible saturation of the napple, which is the smear that's come down. So this would be the, the napple at this particular height, and this would be the water at this particular height. You see this kind of characteristic shape. This looks exactly like the capillary pressure versus saturation curves that we've talked about before. Uh, in the Vedos zone, we have not only um, napple plus water, but we also have air as a third phase. And so these tell us something about what the distributions of these fluids are as you go into the subsurface. So we expect this to be very high saturations of D-napple. And so I guess the, the, the take-home point is that if you think about how the D-napple will rise here, this will almost be 100% saturated, well, 90% saturated, 80, 70. And so this can go into the uh, a borehole that you put through this. But because it will sink to the bottom of that borehole, then even if there is a capillary barrier which would be here, for instance, and you drill a hole below that capillary barrier, presumably it can also flow out of the aquifer into this borehole and keep on going. And so the bottom line is that although the top of this now is going to be controlled by this capillary pressure versus saturation curve, the lower extent, if you keep on drilling a borehole, and there's enough stuff that can come out of the aquifer into this, then this will just fill up and it will give an apparent signature, which really isn't a true signature. So I guess you have to be a, aware of, of that when you look at this. The other component is that as you get very high saturations of this napple, then it will be mobile. As you get to residual saturations, if you stick a straw in here and suck, you won't get any napple out, but you will get water out. And so the napple isn't mobile here, but the water is. And so there'll be an upper limit from where it would come, and that would be defined by the distribution of nap in the subsurface. And so we can guess what that distribution would be based on the capillary pressure versus saturation characteristics. And so if you now drill a hole in this, if you drill a hole down to 10 meters and it fills to a depth of 7, then this is 3 meters of napple that you think you have. But if you do a hole that now goes down to 20 meters, then it will fill from 7 again, and you'll think you'll have 13 instead of 3. And so that's deceiving or deceptive because you need to know where the bottom of this um, capillary barrier is, which is the lowermost extent of where it's gone. So in this particular case, 
it wouldn't actually have gone any further than this lower part, but a deeper hole would suggest that the thickness was actually lower than that. And so I think you need to, to rationalize that. The other thing which, and so, and so I'll skip to this. So the other thing is, I guess, that if you're looking at sampling in a borehole, which is really what's shown here, then the fluids that you'd see in the borehole are different. The denser than, um, than water fluids will sink to the bottom, and they'll define the top of the, the zone from which they come. But if you drill the hole even deeper, then they'll give this kind of false depth, which really isn't there, because it'll, if there's enough, it'll just fall and flow into the hole and fill it up. So you have to be aware of that. Likewise, if you look at the thickness of the floating product, then this height here you'd expect to be larger than reality because of the effect of the oil table effect we talked about. And so we'd be interested to know that you can measure T, but the true thickness is equal to T minus W, which we talked about before, for L and Apple. And I guess for D and Apple, we should make the case that the deeper you dr drill your well, it'll just keep on filling up. And you need to know exactly where the bottom of the capillary barrier is. So you need to know where the capillary barrier is. <coughs> Bless you. Otherwise, you're going to get a false reading as well. And so I guess those are the main points I wanted to, to make today. So one last thing while we have two minutes, uh, once you've done that. So the, the real motivation of this is to be able to take field data and be able to turn those field data into something that's useful, useful to you. The other point to make, I guess, which is shown in this figure here, just as a parting shot, is that if you think about these capillary pressure versus saturation curves that you have here, And that's basically what this is inverted, right? This is uh, depth, but you could also think of it as capillary pressure. Is that if you have a capillary pressure curve that looks like this, are the pore diameters in this curve larger or smaller than the other curve? I think larger. So this is larger. And it's because it's, it breaks over quite at early capillary pressures. Here you have to get to a very large capillary pressure before it is able to accept whatever this second fluid is. And so if you think about these, these also say something about the relative saturations as you go down here. So this would be the saturation of... Um, uh, this would be water. This is yeah. so. This here. This starts off being 100% water saturated. So this is the saturation of, of water that's present here. And this is the growing saturation of napple as you go down. And so you start off with a relatively small saturation of napple, and then as you get down here, this is the bank or the lens that you have. So in the case where you have a uh, smaller graded portion, the part where it gets to be this lens, by definition, has to be progressively deeper because you have to get a larger capillary pressure to be able to inject it into the system. And so the high porosity one uh, would have this, um, yeah, sorry, this, this, this thick bank here that exists at relatively shallow depths which is present uh, here. So the bank here is pure napple. But in the case of the low porosity one, it's only once you get down to a much deeper depth that you'd actually see the benefits of fully saturating it. And so this, again, is absolutely related to these capillary pressure versus saturation curves as you go down in the subsurface.